Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Chandler Wilkerson. I'll be guest hosting today for Adam. And just wanted to get a couple you know, questions out. Uh, do you guys usually wait until like three minutes after the hour in order to start the meeting? And is this agenda good? Yeah, we usually wait a bit to uh, to give people some time to put in topics, uh, maybe add some more issues from the filter. Okay. So that three minutes seems fair. Thank you. Hello. 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 I think Adam sent an email that he's not going to attend. If someone else could host the meeting, I think. Yes, I, I volunteered to help host the meeting. Fortunately, I'm having troubles getting to the Google Talk right this moment. Uh, I, I think Google is having an issue. I'm having issues on my, my end as well. Okay. Well, there was one issue. I already clicked on it. <laughs> that was already in there. So this is uh, 1203. I'll probably just step out of the way and let everybody uh, run the meeting then. Well, from silence, I'm guessing I need to do a bit more. So what is the usual tag? Well, usually uh, there's more stuff in the agenda. Uh, but we've been going over quite a bit of stuff. So I don't really know if there's any. I, I, I have a, a little bit of an esoteric issue that might make sense to talk about. Um, I've been working on this for the last few weeks and um, it's uh, it's not CDI related, it's, it's KubeVert related. Um, and essentially KubeVert has some uh, supporting containers um, that have a very high request to limit ratio. Um, the biggest one being the hot plug attachment container, um, because that, or actually it's a, it's a pod, it's not a container, oh, it's a container in the pod, uh, um, but essentially the container does nothing. It, its entire purpose 
is to tell the cupola to attach the volume that's been referenced in this pod into the node. And then the hot plug logic takes over and actually hot plugs it into the virtual machine. Now we've had a uh, user say, hey, this stopped working when I put a, a limit range in my namespace. And one of the fields you can put on the limit range is the ratio of request to memory or a request to limit for both CPU and memory. Um, and if you have a you know lower ratio, then the uh, attachment pile won't start because the ratio is too high. And I, I'll probably bring this whole thing up in the actual kubevert meeting on Wednesday. Um, I just wanted to see if anybody had any uh, thoughts on this. Um, the same issue happens for container disks because the container disks have a, a you know an inner container with a very high request to limit ratio. Uh, VertIOFS also creates a container to get the VertIOFS uh, into the virtual machine, and then any sidecars. <clears throat> So if people created a sidecar to modify the domain XML, again, it it does almost nothing except in the in the startup. All of those have a very high request to limit ratio, and they all fail when I put a limit range with a ratio in my namespace. Um, having sort of explained the issue here, um, I have a PR out right now that for specifically for the um, hot plug pod um, sets the request to be the limit on both CPU and memory. And um, that will fix the, the uh, uh, ratio being in the namespace. Um, it's just a little bit of wasteful because I am essentially reserving CPU and memory for a container that doesn't do anything. Um, but it only happens if you actually hot plug a disk. If you don't care about hot plug, you know, it, it's not gonna affect you. Um, so my question is how, uh, how much of an issue would that be for people that I am actually now um, reserving essentially it's only like 80 megabytes of memory it's not like it's a huge amount of memory but um it's an issue for people if we do that um or am i going to get pushback on that particular pr so i think i think this uh way of tackling it is not really much different from um from what we do to vms today which is uh just add add some overhead to the user uh, resource request. Right. So uh, I think it's not the end of the world. It's uh, it's you're basically doing the th same thing, but for uh, for a sidecar pod. Right. And regarding the way forward in general, I think uh, the kind of API that we have in CDI is basically the way to go. I, I can't see another scenario where it's uh, where something can take a place of a full-blown API that gives you an option to just put your put your defaults for these kind of pods right and uh, be happy with it. And and just so everybody else knows, um in CDI in the CDI CR you can set a configuration where you tell it use these requests and limits on the worker pods. Um, and you know you can use that essentially to get the correct ratio you want if you have a, a limit range with a ratio in it. Um, um, or you know if if you have a a particular image that for whatever reason uses more memory than the default, you can increase the the amount of memory that's available for the pod. Um, so I, I I don't know how many people we have here that that are running this on like large 
clusters or anything like that. It doesn't look like we have too many people that would do that. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll bring this up on Wednesday on the uh, Kubrick meeting itself. Hopefully we'll have some people there that, that you know, run this on large clusters because I, I suspect for people with, with small clusters, it, it's not going to matter that much. But if you have large clusters, you know, all the little uh, reserve pieces of memory and CPU might add up. Uh, Alexander will try uh, directly the mailing list. I don't know if on Wednesday we have so many people. Right. Right. Well, that that was my my one and only issue that I had. Did you want to record a PR number for, or pop in a link for your PR? Uh, yes. Let me go find that for a second. There it is. And just paste it in the chat. Okay. Nope. There we go. Okay. Does anybody want to talk about twelve oh three? I think we can just uh, pick up issues from the 36 we have on the issue page. Just uh, 1203 is the last one we uh, stopped on. Yeah, we, we started uh, at the bottom and, and, and moved our way up just for like the first time. And we stopped at 1203 last time. We've got two pages here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not like cute word where there's like 600 pages. So. No wonder. Uh, no, no worries. I meant. <laughs> okay. So the next one up would be. Let's try to keep the list here. Are we looking for ones with replies already, or? Uh, I think sometimes some of these have fallen through the cracks. We usually try to triage them as we see them. Um, this this one is is like really old. It's like you know CDI version one point sixteen, and we're on like one fifty something. So, um, but I I think the issue still remains. Um, so essentially what happens to get you know progress updates in, in data volumes is the controller actually directly connects to the the pod and connects to uh one of the metric endpoints that has the uh a progress update and uh for for richard here we're actually just using the cumulative image uh dash p where it's printing the percentage um or if we're doing a, a cumulative conversion, uh, and if we're directly writing, you know, if we're actually like downloading it through a standard HTTP connection, um, most of the time we can actually calculate the percentage because we don't know the total, um, and that's when we do the NA. This particular issue seems to be about um, uh, not being able to connect because us of some sort of network policy. We're actually directly connecting to the pod. Um, and if there's a network policy that prevents that, then um, you know, we, we can't get the information and we can't uh, uh, print the percentage. Um, I don't know exactly what they would like us to do about this, but, uh, oh, actually, 
they, they tell us at the first line. They want a, a service associated with the pod uh, and then connect to the service so that uh, we're not connecting to the IP address of the pod. Um, that actually shouldn't be terribly hard to do. We just need to create services on the fly for each pod to connect to them. Uh, and it might actually make some of the logic in the controller simpler because in the controller, we're looking up the, the IP address and then the, um, uh, what is it, the endpoints on the pod. And if we have a service, we just connect to the service. So it might, it might actually be simpler from a controller perspective. I think you were talking about 1203. I was a bit confused, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I am talking about 1203. I was, I was looking at the, okay. <laughs> talking about, right? I had, I had the screen on the wrong one. I was wondering. Oh, okay. I'm just I following. My own, so. <clears throat> so I think maybe. I, I know, um, I just wanted to interject. I don't really have any comment about this particular bug, but I do. We have a similar problem elsewhere where we want to sort of communicate progress right. of pods that are you know, that are doing things that take a long time. And I don't, I don't know of a good way to do it, to be honest. And so I'm really, if anyone finds out how to sort of fix this problem in general, I'm, I'm quite interested. So, so we, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to this, but I, I'm, I'm interested to know what an answer would look like. So, so what we did for the, the progress, um, so we, we have some way in, in our application to figure out the progress. And um, essentially what we did is we created a, a Prometheus uh, endpoint um, and cre creating one is, is really easy. Uh, you just call the library function and um, set up the uh, type of gauge you want. Um, and essentially it's, it's just a zero to 100 gauge. Um, um, and then our controller is, is directly connecting um, to the pod, to that uh, endpoint, and it, it basically just gets the Prometheus um, output and finds the correct field and, and displays that. Um, obviously, that's not perfect, as this bug um, shows us we probably should not be directly connecting to the pod but put a service in front of it. And then the service is um, configured to connect to the pod, and then we can just connect to the service. Um, I think uh, Alex might know, don't we have another bug where sometimes in the middle, maybe if the pod dies and it, it ends up on a different node or something that the IP address changes and then our service is all, or our, our controller, is confused about it and is trying to connect to the old IP address? No, I think the controller is always uh, guessing it. Uh, it. It starts over the guessing process. So okay. it'll always work against uh, updated. I, uh, I thought I saw version. something uh, about the, the update not being right because it was trying to connect to the wrong IP address. And I, I think maybe doing a service uh, might actually solve that problem. So. I think I had an issue about, um, yeah, you're right. That there was something similar, but uh, I think the issue is that we just don't play nice when uh, when the networking is bad in the cluster. I, I'll have to dig it out. So do, do we think that this issue should actually just be fixed? I don't think it's going to be very hard to fix because creating a service that points to the pod is, is relatively straightforward, right? You just put a label on it and point this service to the label. Um, you know, we haven't done anything with this. I actually didn't know this existed. Otherwise, I probably would have already fixed it some time ago. I mean, thanks for that explanation, Alex. It does, it does I mean, I know you say it's quite easy, but it does sound, you know, to my mind, it sounds 
pretty complicated. You've got a service and you've got something in the pod which is answering requests. And, well, the, and if, you, if you compare it to log files, like pods will just collect, you know, you can just get the logs from a pod easily. But, um, but how, how do you do it in an automated fashion, right? You have to have some sort of a log collector service that connects to the pod to... Well, hang, well no, no, hang on. What I'm, saying, what I'm saying here is that if you... Um, it, it just seemed to me when I looked at this that, that that there should just be a way for... In the same way that log, logs are collected, there should just be a way... Um, and this is nothing to do with Kuba. This is like an entirely a Kubernetes thing. There should just be a way to to signal some small amounts of data like that from inside the pod to the metadata of the pod. Just I don't I don't have a like a plan here or anything. I'm just saying it it sounds really really complicated for something that must be really obvious and everyone must have have this problem at some point. So um, it, it's basically all about do you want your workload to know that it's running inside of Kubernetes. Because it, it, it should be, if we provide our, our importer pod with a, a kube config and, and you know, you know, pass the library to connect to Kubernetes, we can essentially um, just write some code where the pod itself just updates the um, resource that wants the information. It can just update it. The thing is, we were um, we don't really want to let the pod know, or the the, the the application that's running in the pod know that it's running in Kubernetes, because then it's like linked to Kubernetes. So if you don't want to do that now, then you need to somehow get this information from the pod. And uh, you know, the Prometheus endpoint every day is one way. Um, you could do an HTTP endpoint where you just connect to the HTTP endpoint to get some information. That's another way. It, that's essentially what the Prometheus endpoint is. It's just an HTTP endpoint. But um, Prometheus has a bunch of libraries that you can use to, to get this information relatively easily. Um, so in, instead of pushing the information from the, the, the pod itself, now you're like polling it, right? You're just connecting to it like, hey, has something changed? Has your progress updated, et cetera? Uh, it's, it's just sort of like a, a philosophy um, thing. If, if, if you don't care that your application knows it's running in Kubernetes, it's probably simpler to pass it a kube config that it can use to update the resource itself. And, and let the application do that. Uh, but if you do care, then you have to go through some gymnastics to, to get the information. I guess a kube config would be, it'd be hard to make that secure, wouldn't it, as, as well? No, it's, um, uh, it's, it's actually not that bad um, because if you start pod as a certain uh, service account, um, there's a secret that's automatically injected that is the kube config for that account. And um, it's, it's in, a, in a stable place. So you can just read that kube config and build your client from there and then use the client to connect to the Kubernetes uh, cluster and, and do the updates. It's, it's not super hard to do. And, and all the information you really need is, is there. Um, but the, the problem from, from my perspective is just at that point, you've linked your application to Kubernetes, right? And you, you can run it outside of Kubernetes in, in another orchestrator for, you know, if, for whatever reason you want to do that. So. Okay, okay. So just another question is, is, can you snoop on files in the pod easily? I mean, maybe we could just write the data to a file and then uh well essentially what if you if you mount a secret in a pod it shows up as a file somewhere so if your user can connect to the pod and and uh then you can snoop on files yes uh but if your user can connect to the pod then it can essentially do anything already so it's 
Okay, thanks. It was very interesting. But yeah, there's there's a couple of secrets that got automatically injected into every pod. Um, and, and one of them is 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 the cube config of the service account that's running the pod. So. So let's let's um I, I think we should let's get back to this this issue. I think we should actually do uh should fix it. Um, um I'm I'm actually typing a message here. Um All right. So now if, if, if they respond, uh, at least I'll get the, the email here. Okay. And since we never get, uh, seem to get through all the, um, the different ones. Oh, where we stop? If you could just put it in, saying that this is the one we stopped at. So for next. Okay. Time. I was also going to ask if you want to do any like time boxing or, or just kind of let discussions happen naturally. We, uh, you know, we we just started these um, um, uh, meetings, so we're still sort of trying to figure out what a good format is. Um, because as you can see, we started off with having quite a few, you know, things to discuss in the beginning, but we're sort of running out. So, you know, it'll probably end up being mostly a bug triage thing. So, okay. Do you want to do uh, twelve eighty nine next? Yeah. So the Ceph CSI people, uh, it's pr actually pretty surprising that they want to use CDI to kind of have uh, like a happy path that tests their uh, CSI driver. So yeah, really but, interesting issue. But the thing is, our our test suite is really large, and it does a lot of different things, and, and not all of them are related to Ceph CSI. So. But couldn't we could uh, we give them like a label, uh, like a few happy flow tests that are lab labeled, and uh, then they could just run that small subset. You know, like maybe the um, maybe those parameterized data volume tests. You know, the ones that do import, clone, upload, and the same. Uh, the same describe block. Well, doesn't uh, did we upgrade to Ginkgo two yet? In... No, we did no. not. Uh, doesn't Ginkgo two have have an actual label uh, on the test where you can actually put a label? I, I've seen those in Kubeword, so I know Kubeword is on two point zero already. Um, yeah, but you could do it in Ginkgo one as well. Uh, we do it for the destructive tests. Well, we 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 put a a, a label on there and then pass a, a regex to find the particular label. But it, it's not really like a, a a separate label field. It's 
we put a particular magic string in our test name and then use a regex to find it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it, it'll probably work. Uh, I think having an actual label, uh, which is a separate field, would be nicer. Um, yep. Um, we probably should do this. Do we have a card for this? Do you know if we have a card for this in our? Probably not, just an issue in, uh, on our repository. Okay, so let me. Um, there's a link there to the Ceph CSI, uh, to a Ceph CSI PR. Maybe that has more information. Maybe they already ended up implementing this somehow. Uh, if you scroll down, yeah, it got mentioned in uh, Ceph CSI. Add workload test. Okay, no, it's just uh, basically the same description as the CI issue. Right. So I I think if we can just put it at least on our backlog uh, on Jira, then you know we'll have a chance of it actually being scheduled for sprint. Again, I don't think this is going to be very hard. It's just we need somebody to actually do it. Um, and I think if we create a card, um, then that would help. Um, so I will create a card and put a link to it uh, in this uh, issue. Okay. Would you like to go back to the list now, or wait until? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's go back to the list, and I will I will okay. I'll create a card uh, for it and, and put a comment in there. All right. Allow more than one access mode in DB spec. All right. So, um. I added this a long time ago. Um, and the main issue was for um, manually created NFS uh, persistent volumes. Um, you know, in, in the persistent volume, you have to say both uh, read write many and read write ones. And then when, um, when you create a PVC, you can either specify read write once or read write many, and it will bind uh, or um, allow read write once and read write many in the PVC spec, and it will also bind. And um, right now, a data volume will reject uh, any um, um, you know the PVC part of the data volume. If you put in more than one access mode, it's rejected even though it's an array and you can specify more than once and it should accept it. So this was just uh, me saying, hey, we need to fix this where we allow, you know, both. It's, I, I since then I don't think I've actually seen anybody create a, or, or uh, create a PVC with both, um, but it's technically possible. So I don't think we should reject it. Um, and if, and if uh, actually we, we can probably close this um, since I've never actually seen anybody do that. It, it's just one of those, it's theoretically possible, so we should allow it, but nobody's ever actually done it. So. Okay, I have seen a, a use case where you create a DB and you don't necessarily, like if you don't, uh, specify one of those modes, does it just kind of accept whatever the default storage class provides? 
Um, no. So if if that we've we added since then we've added a uh, storage specification. So um, as part of the data volume, you can either provide the PVC. I'm going to call it a template. The PVC template. And, and that's the, the template that the controller will use to create the PVC. But then we've added a storage section. And in the storage section, you can omit certain required fields that are required in the PVC section, like access mode, volume mode. Um, what happens is uh, our, we also created something called a storage profile. And the storage profile, basically, for certain storage provider says, okay, for this particular storage provider, the optimal access mode and volume mode is this. For instance, for Ceph, it's a block mode, read write many, right? So if you omit that in the storage section, it will go and look in the storage profile and say, oh, okay, we should use block read write many. And then when it creates the actual PVC, it basically fills in the blanks from the storage profile and then creates the PVC that in theory should be optimal for uh, the storage you're using. Okay, so, so this why, would really be just a very edge problem. case. <laughs> what do you mean in this edge case? This uh, particular. Well, edge. this particular thing is, is very much, very much an edge case. Uh, and I actually, I am just going to close it because I don't think um, I don't think it's very interesting, uh, and it, it's more uh, me being a little pedantic that you know, hey, we should allow it, but um, so I'm 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 fine closing that. Okay. So a feature request for allowing configuration of QMU images or converts, cache type option. Yeah, it is pretty interesting. We've gone back and forth between uh, changing the default value on this. So we had, uh, I think the first year CDI, it had unsafe, which was the default or is the default. Then at some point we decided to uh, pull closer to rev and we made the cache uh, option uh, be none. And then uh, recently with some help, we concluded that write back was the way to go for us. So we're currently sitting at set up on uh, write back cache mode, but uh, I think it makes sense to make this configurable. It's just, uh, if you scroll down, it's uh, there's a whole matrix uh, that we need to implement for this and we should decide on it. The thing is, if, um, okay, so, you, okay, Alexander summarizes it pretty well in, on this comment here. So global level, there's a storage class level and a per data volume level. So I think that's pretty much it. We have to give people the uh, a global knob so they could just always go with the certain cache mode and then a per storage one. And then sometimes somebody wants uh, to use none on, on their data volumes and sometimes they want other things. So you just give them a data volume knob. I think that's pretty much the best way to go. What what I am missing is that uh, for some reason, nobody was uh, pushing on this too much. This is a pretty old issue, but it totally makes sense. Um, certain storages make sense with uh, certain cache modes, others don't. and. The issue to me makes total sense and we should, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm missing something and this is not so desired as I think it is. There's, a, there's an interesting um, problem that you might run into if you're, 
so we, we run into this in Vert Builder where you mix up um, direct, like O direct writes with uh, reads that come from the page cache, and you can actually get stale data in the page cache that doesn't reflect what's actually being written to disk. Mm -hmm. it, it, the, to be very specific about this, it, it occurs when you run QM image convert and then you run QMU very quickly afterwards on that disk image. Um, you can have QMU seeing stale data. And I can't quite remember exactly what combinations cause problems and what don't. You're probably best to ask Kevin about this. Um, so you need to be a little bit careful here with this. Um, you may run into problems like that, and there may even be like a kind of security issue as well. Yeah, I, I think that's the reason why we went with cache none at some point. Um, in particular, we saw this with Gluster and or Seth, where we had the, the pod that was writing the image on node A, and then immediately once it was done, on node B, we started a VM that was trying to use it, and, and that one didn't get all the data yet. Um, due to some caching on node A. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's actually not an easy problem to solve. Uh, as you can tell, we've, we've gone from different cache modes. Uh, yeah, it's just that for this specific uh, use case, I think we were just uh, kind of ruining this person's flows by yeah. using cache none, like they were just making things uh, slower. I think it's NFS related, NFS uh, 4.1. Uh, not sure exactly what happens, but uh, from the discussion and this issue, it seems that cache none didn't make sense. So they would have benefited a lot from, uh, from uh, making this configurable. But I don't know what what they would go for instead of none. I th I don't think the issue has that information. Right. I don't. I don't think it it would matter that much for uh, you know if we give them all the options, then they can pick what's best for their particular use case. Uh, to me, the question more is what level do we want to implement this? Right. I, I I gave three levels on um, you know a cluster level, a storage class level, or a data volume level. Or all three, I don't know. Um, each one has pluses and minuses, right? If you set it at a global level, you set it once and it applies it to everything. But if you have two different storage classes that want different uh, modes, then you can't, you know, express that. Um, if you do it at a storage class level, you have to set it on multiple storage classes. Um, so there's more configuration. And if you set it on a, a data volume level, then every time you create a data volume, you have to set it, right? If you have a need for a different value than what the default is. Yeah, I think for, in order for this to be complete, we'll have to uh, implement all three of them. Um, maybe we should, for now, just... Uh, I see Maya already did this. Just ping the person that opened it and uh, just take interest what, if, if the performance issue resolved itself. Because yeah. we did change, uh, we did go to write back instead of cache none. So I think the last communication on this issue was uh, the original poster. Uh, saying I still want it uh, user configurable. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I missed that one. All right. So what do we want to do with this then? Should we make a card for it? I'll just add it to the list of cards I need to make. Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. All right. So I'll make two cards then, one for this one and one for the previous one. And then once I've created the card, I'll, I'll link them in here because they should be 
uh, public at this point. The Jira instance is public, so. All right, we've got five minutes left till <laughs> the noted time of the meeting ending. Want to do one more or wrap up? Yeah, we, we could do one more. I think the next one is relatively straight. Well, it's not actually really straightforward. Um, okay. So this bug also predates, um, I think, the uh, import cron. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, and the original problem that inspired this, um, it was a rel URL. And instead of erroring, it gave you some HTML and a success, success thing. So it looked like a successful import, except it was definitely not an image you could boot. So there's is quite a bit of discussion in this one already. Um, So I, I think we're, we seem to be heading into just download the file to scratch space and then do the conversion. Uh, just doing an inline seems to have uh, problems, especially if we have a, like a GSIP or a, a, a XE type compression in there. Um, if we do that, then the checksum should be relatively straightforward to compute by once we have the the data in the scratch space doing the checksum is simple. So. Uh, since we have Richard here, he might know, is there a filter or a plugin that you can provide a checksum and then Kimu image will do the checksum on the file you provide? I was, I was thinking about that actually. Um, so there isn't one, but it might be possible to add one. Um, I mean, it's sort of the fundamental problem is you have to read the whole file, which right. What they're sort of trying to avoid, but obviously, if you want to compute a checksum, you've got to read the whole file. Can't get around that. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll think about it. I don't think you can get around having to read the entire file to get the checksum. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. I mean, it's like, obviously, um, <laughs> yeah, go do that. But you can you can skip the um, the holes if you're if you have an image with holes. Right. So that's that's a. Uh, uh, immediate benefit. Um, so I think we should just leave this one as the last one we looked at so that for the next time we'll look at it again and see what we uh, we can get a better answer. Uh, okay. Clean that up. 
I guess on one other thing we could do regarding the original scenario is possibly detect very suspicious looking images that uh, like it's uh, uh, it gave out HTML so that's detectable. That's gonna be like a common scenario. Maybe we can make that into an alert. Or maybe look for no uh, partitioning. That's, but that's, I don't know. Maybe someone really wants to import an image that way that doesn't, isn't partitioned in any way. That's, there's actually no reason that it can't be that way. It just needs to have a bootloader, I think. So, I don't know. But HTML is probably wrong <laughs> if it's a valid HTML. Right. So maybe if, if you know, you should have a redirect here you know, on getting a redirect or something, and it just spits out some HTML at you saying, hey, we can redirect or something. Probably should not. Uh, Boot from it because it won't work. But I think that's a different issue than this particular uh, uh, request. This was really doing a checksum on the downloaded file before you actually try and boot it. So, and maybe you know, confirm that the, the one you got is the, is the correct one. Right? There are no download errors or bit flipping going on. All right, I think we're over time at this point. Yeah, I think we can leave off there. All right, sounds good. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.